Um, I am Stacy Kopp, and I'm also one of the members of the organizing committee. And it's my great privilege today to introduce our speaker, um, Professor Stacy Branham. She is an associate professor of informatics whose work explores digital equity and inclusion for people with disabilities. As a person with a disability herself, she engages members of the disabled community to drive change through her research, service, and teaching. In a recent partnership with Google and people with disabilities, she studied the question, what does it mean for a digital illustration of a disabled person to be inclusive? Together, they co-designed inclusive profile images, which now ship on millions of Google Chromebooks, marking the first time that a person who is blind can independently choose a representative profile image for themselves. To improve the inclusivity of profile images in all contexts, Branham and her collaborators now routinely give educational webinars to the general public on best practices in inclusive Im imagery. Branham is a co-PI of Access Computing, which is a national initiative to broaden participation in computing to include people with disabilities. She's won numerous awards. Um, in 2021, she received the prestigious NSF Career Award and was also named one of the brilliant 10 rising STEM researchers by Popular Science. So we are very excited to hear what you have to say today. Do you all know how a blind person accesses a touchscreen phone? I mean, do you really know? Like, could you show me right now how they do it? All right, one, two, three, four, five. About five hands in the live audience here, um, and there are roughly 50 people in the audience. This is a question that has captivated me for the past decade. So I'm really, really happy today to be able to share with you why it's so special to me and why I think that if all of us here at UCI knew the answer to this question, we'd have a more equitable, inclusive culture, and um, we'd more fully embody the core values of what it means to be an institution of higher education. So um, my story has four parts. First, how did I find this question? I call that uh, finding my what. Second, what made this question stick in my mind and my heart? I call that finding my why. Part two, part three is um, how does this question guide what I do every day as a professor? And I call that uh, what I do. And then if I'm lucky, by the end, part four, um, a few of you will feel a little piece of that energy that makes me uh, drawn to this question. You'll, you'll want to know how you can help out. So uh, I'll share with you a few things that could start you on your journey. I call that what we do. All right, so we got four parts. We got 12 pictures. We got 30 minutes. Are you ready? <laughs> good, good, good. Here we go. Um, and by the way, if you'd like to follow along as a matter of good accessibility practice, you can grab my slides and all the links to my favorite little resources at my link tree. Go to l-i-n-k-t-r dot e-e slash my name, S-T-A-C-Y. B-R-A-N-H-A-M. All right, so part one, finding my what? The year is 2003. Some of you haven't even been born. <laughs> but I, Stacey Branham, uh, have just graduated high school and I'm starting as a first year computer science major at Virginia Tech. A few things to know about my experience and outlook at this time. Uh, when I walked into my very first computer science classroom, it was 100 seats there were three other femme presenting people, 4% women, all right? So I viscerally felt like I did not belong. Uh, yet, when I got an email from the Association for Women in Computing that week, I uh, thought, why on earth is there an Association for Women in Computing? Why not have an Association for People with uh, Brown Hair in Computing, for example? So I deleted their invitation to the meeting. Um, and then third, uh, I actually had this notion that I was going to race through undergrad, use all my AP credits, and graduate in three years and be done with it. All right. So this is, by the way, is a picture of my high school yearbook. And what I like about it is that they misspelled my name. And uh, I find it funny because uh, not only did the yearbook club not know who I was, it turns out that I didn't know who I was that much um, at that point in my life either. And I was about to find out. Okay, so fast forward four years. 
about to graduate with my bachelor's degree in computer science, um, one thing hadn't changed. My graduating class comprised 4.2% women. That's the problem with leaky pipelines. <laughs> they, never, uh, they never bring more people than they tend to keep losing. Um, but not unrelated to that, I was the president, I'm going to say that again, I was the president of the Association for Women in Computing. So I went from thinking, why does that club exist to like, it needs to exist and I want to lead it, <laughs> okay? Um, and then not only that, but I stayed there for all four years and I thought, I want to stay here forever. I want to be a professor. Uh, so what happened? That's a pretty serious 180, right, in four years. So what happened in those four years? Well, some bad things happened in those four years. You know, the daily gendered microaggressions, the sexual harassment, sexual assault. Um, those things really uh, clarified for me my womanness in this society. Uh, but a lot of good things happened, right? And I think about it as me finding my love for service, for teaching, and for research. So for service, I started volunteering on every, uh, for everything I could. Um, for example, I hosted this workshop for uh, middle school girls to teach them about wireless communication technologies. It was a super blast. Um, in terms of teaching, I became an undergraduate, oh, pardon me, an undergraduate teaching assistant. Um, and I taught this introduction to computer programming for non-majors. And I remember in my office hours, I would invite students to come, like, come to my office hours. And my favorite thing to tell them was, um, if ever you feel stumped and stupid, it's not you. It's that we haven't figured out how to make the tools um, make computing more accessible to you. So we need you to stick with it and help us fix that for the next generation. Right? I still believe that. And um, in terms of research, I did a quarter of undergraduate research and I fell in love. It was amazing to me to realize that the textbooks were not finished, right? Uh, we were still exploring and creating knowledge as a people and I could be part of that knowledge production. It was a really, really exciting, empowering idea. Um, so there's this phrase, from a really famous computer scientist named Karen Spark Jones. She says, computing is too important to be left to men. And by the time that I finished my undergraduate, I really believed that. And I wanted to make sure that no other woman had to survive a 4% ratio in her undergraduate computer science class. Um, also, I didn't think that the way that I was taught computer science was right. I think that service, teaching, and research should be opportunities made available to students through their coursework. It should be integrated into computing, and I wanted to fix that too, so I stayed. All right, this is a picture of me my senior year. Um, this is me eating my words because I was the president of the Association for Women in Computing. I'm wearing a t-shirt that uh, shows the logo that I created for that club, and that was on Women in Computing Day. We brought in 100 young women from a middle school, from the local uh, community, and we tried to convince them that they wanted to be women in computing too. Don't ask about the weird bird. <laughs> so I decided to go to grad school and earn my PhD. Um, and when I did, I, I uh, happened to take a class on intersectional feminism. It was amazing. I realized, oh, I'm not only a woman, I'm a wealthy white woman, queer woman, uh, who was born in the United States of America. I had all these other identities and privileges that came along with that. And I became deeply interested in the intersections of computer science and feminism. So I remember I was having a conversation about my interest and another of my peers, a man, said, feminism has nothing to do with computer science. So you know what I did? I wrote my entire dissertation on feminist modes of digital communication <laughs> that was my way of saying to him and people of his um, thought process that women's bodies and ideas belong here in computer science. And you know what? My committee signed off on the paper and I got my PhD, so it worked. Um, so um, if you've been snoozing through part one, pay attention now. This is a really critical moment. <laughs> By sheer happenstance, I ended up uh, securing a postdoc. Um, to continue my studies. And it just so happened, the person I was going to work with is the person who invented the technology that enables blind people to access touchscreen phones. So I don't actually remember the, the moment when this happened, but I presume it was like our first meeting. And he sat down with me with an eyebrow cocked up and he said, 
So uh, do you even know how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone? <laughs> like, who have I hired? And um, little did I know that um, that was going to be uh, the moment when I found my what. This is a picture of me just after I defended my dissertation. I'm Dr. Stacy, and I'm nerding out a little bit. I think it's cut off a bit, but um, I'm bending over with my stethoscope and listening to the clock beats of my uh, computer. Okay, part two, finding my why. In 2014, I started that postdoc, and I was studying accessible computing for the first time. Um, it turns out I didn't even know what disability was. I mean, I thought I knew what disability was, but I had no idea what it was, and I learned a lot. So um, turns out that disability can be visible and invisible, right? So invisible disabilities um, include things like chronic illness, neurodiversity, mental illness, things like this. I also learned that disability is extremely fluid. So you can have a permanent disability, but you can also have a temporary disability, like when I was pregnant and I waddled everywhere. <laughs> uh, not only that, but you can have a, um, a situational disability. Like if you've ever seen me ambitiously try to go in Donald Bryn Hall, and I've got my bicycle on one hand, and I've got my coffee on the other hand, and I have to elbow the door actuator to open the door and let me in, right? I'm not a wheelchair user, but that's an extremely useful technology when I have a situational disability. So um, finally, disability is extremely pervasive. Right? It's actually the largest minority population in the world, people with disabilities. And we have a pipeline problem too. So uh, roughly 25 to 30 percent, depending on who you ask, of the general population have a disability. But when you look at the undergraduate population at a place like this, it's down to 20 percent. Graduate population, 8 percent. Faculty, 4 percent. Staff, I couldn't even find numbers. That's a big problem. Right? So. We have a problem with accessibility in, in higher education. Actually, I'm curious, do you or someone you know identify as having a disability? I think every, almost every hand should go up. <laughs> and even if you don't know, maybe there are people with invisible disabilities in your circles. Um, so it's extremely common. All right, so after I knew what disability was, two things occurred to me. First, I was absolutely shocked and appalled that I had a bachelor's degree in computer science, a PhD in computer science, and yet I had never thought about how a person who's blind or a person with any disability whatsoever used technology. What that means to me is that I didn't know how to make accessible technologies. I knew how to make ableist technologies. Um, and it's worse than that because even those of us who are not computer scientists make inaccessible digital media all the time. How many of us have ever made a PDF file? Yeah. How many of you have ever shared a digital image? I'd be willing to put money down that 90 to 100 percent of those files that you've shared, unless you're someone special like Meredith Ehrenberg over here, <laughs> that 90 to 100 percent of those are completely inaccessible to people with disabilities. Okay. Um, the last thing I want to say about this, this first insight is that disability is the forgotten um, civil rights movement in our culture, I think. And it's commonly left out of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, right? So if you see DEI in someone's title or in a mission statement or a vision statement around campus, um, oftentimes you don't see disability or accessibility mentioned. It's a real big problem in my mind. Um, some people are starting to talk about DEIA, diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, right? And I really want to see all of those Titles and mission statements, vision statements, start to integrate the A. Okay, here's my second realization. It's a big one. I have a disability. <laughs> so um, I have a psychosocial disability or a mental illness. Um, and uh, mental illness is highly stigmatized. So people tend not to talk about it, right? And actually, I didn't talk about it my whole life until I got tenure. <laughs> Thank goodness for tenure. It's a really important thing. Um, so I have CPTSD, Complex Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder. I grew up in a household where I experienced emotional abuse from my father, who has um, undiagnosed narcissistic personality disorder. So what that amounts to for me is that um, 
I have a really low sense of self-worth. I experience depression, anxiety, panic attacks. Um, and as my therapist says, I deal with that anxiety by acting in, doing self-harm activities. So, for example, I have trichotillomania, a lot of syllables. <laughs> but that means that I pull out my own hair. So I have a very large bald spot on the top of my head that I try very hard to hide because I'm embarrassed by it. It outs me as being different. Um, so in any event, uh, I found out that I had a disability and I started realizing that the community of people with disabilities and the ways that we understand disability really helped me to manage um, my experience and to understand it. All right, so this is a picture of me and my license to do research at UMBC. I was a postdoc at this time. And I find it interesting because I'm so cheery and I look like I'm ready to tackle the world. Um, but uh, as I just mentioned, I really didn't know about accessibility or disability. And so uh, I think that I was actually prepared to commit malpractice, so to speak, at that point. Um, all right. So uh, I wanted to point out that disability has actually made it difficult for me to continue on in computer science, to continue on in academia. And I wanted to point out a couple concrete ways in which that's the case. So um, in 2015, I became a lecturer. That means that I was teaching faculty um, instead of research-focused faculty at UMBC. And after two years in that job, I absolutely loved it. I thought I might do it the rest of my life, except I wanted to make change in the institution, right? I wanted to make it easier for women and people with disabilities to succeed. And I realized I didn't have the power or claims to authority needed to do that as a lecturer. So I decided to become an assistant professor, tenure track assistant professor. And I went to my mentor at the time and I said, look, I realized what I need to do. I want to become an assistant professor at a research institution. And she turned to me. She basically told me, I don't think you have it in you. It really hurt, but because of my disability, I believed her. <laughs> I thought, yeah, what was I thinking? I'm not smart enough, not able enough. Um, and because I wasn't feeling great in my career at this time, I actually decided to go out and seek a therapist. Best move I've ever made. <laughs> I started talking to my therapist about what's happening at work, and she's like, I'm not so sure this is about work. I think it goes deeper. We started pulling back the layers, talking about my past. and um, it turns out that you know, I was really undervaluing myself. Um, and letting her have too much, my mentor, have too much control over my, over my future and my career. And so my therapist gave me this idea. She's like, well, what if you find a mentor who believes in you and helps pull you up? And I did that. It made all the world a difference. <laughs> OK, so I have one more example that I want to share with you about disability and academia. So in 2017, with that mentor support, um, I started going out and giving talks. And I was preparing to go on the job market and get a tenure track position. Um, and I was preparing for this really important talk. Lots of important people were going to be there. Um, and because of my disability, I had extreme anxiety. I, about a week before the talk, I stopped being able to sleep at night. I had insomnia. I also had acid reflux, so I had this knot in the back of my throat, reminding me at every moment of my fear. And then the night before the talk, um, I was, had such a crisis of confidence that I thought, this talk is terrible. I have to remake it entirely. And I stayed up all night reworking my talk. In the morning, I gave my talk. And after, people started coming up to me and saying, what a wonderful talk. Can you come give a talk at University of Washington, at UCSD, at University of Maryland? It's hard to say this, but I was so sick that I thought they were mocking me. I couldn't believe that I had ideas that other people wanted to, sh wanted to hear, would find value in. Um, it didn't feel good, so I went back to my therapist and I talked through it, and she um, had been talking to me for a while about possibly going on medication, anti-anxiety medication, and I was really, really resistant because by taking medication, it meant that I had to acknowledge um, that I had uh, a disability, right? Uh, it's just another concrete way of accepting that. Um, but I did, I gave it a try. And um, 
it changed my world. Uh, I've been on and off of medication as I need it over the past five or six years, maybe three different times. And through the medication and through therapy, I came to a place where I no longer have that sleeplessness before public speaking. I no longer have acid reflux, it's amazing. Um, and I, I believe that I have something good to share. Um, so I'm really, really thankful that I embraced um, taking medication. So this is a picture of me a day or two before I gave that talk. And if you look at me, I look all the calmness, right? And happiness. This is invisible disability, right? Underneath the surface, I, um, I'm exhausted and I feel so small. OK, so then something incredible happened. <laughs> Uh, some of you may recognize this picture. Um, I got my dream job as an assistant professor here at UCI in informatics. Um, I could finally do my work as a woman, as a person with a disability who cares deeply about service teaching and research. And, um, you know, computing and higher education, uh, something I like to say now, is that they're too important to be left to non-disabled men. <laughs> All right. So this is a picture on the bricks right outside Donald Bryn Hall. On my very first day to campus, I was just honestly so tickled that they, I schnookered them into giving me a job and I was here. And so I was walking along and I saw this brick and it says Deborah Richardson, founding dean of the School of ICS. Deborah is a queer woman in computing. What, an, what a rarity to have a queer woman in computing uh, be the founding dean of a school. Um, it made me feel like this is the absolute right place for me because it has something to bring to me as a woman in computing and I have something to give to it as regards trying to make it easier for people with disabilities to be here. Okay. All right. Are you still with me? Sweet. Okay. Part three. What I do. So let me briefly share with you how this question drives what I do on the day to day as a professor. And I'm going to tell you about honestly some of the most boring projects that I do, <laughs> the least flashy projects. Again, tenure is wonderful because I get to do what matters, not what sells. Um, so as a professor, I get to do service. In 2020, I became the adjunct co-chair for accessibility on the executive committee of my research field. Um, called ACM SIGCHI. You don't have to know what that means. Um, basically, I was in charge of making sure that the 28 conferences they run are accessible. Um, and this was, we were the first people in that role ever. It was a new role. And so we had a real concern that as soon as it appeared, it might disappear. Because there was no reason. Adjuncts, you can get rid of adjuncts if you're the new president of the organization. So we tried to make the position too big to sweep away. <laughs> so what we did is we tripled the budget to about $100,000 a year. We created a mission and a vision statement. We recruited 14 people to a committee, and we gave them lots of work. <laughs> and they did lots of work for us. And one of the things that they did is they started centralizing accessibility for our conferences. So for example, we would pay for all of the papers published in uh, various conferences to be uh, made accessible by a third party. So all of a sudden, papers went from being almost like 0% of them being accessible to almost 100% of them being accessible. So we were providing good service. And the other thing we did is we changed the bylaws so that you couldn't write out the accessibility chair. They're just now a vice president of accessibility. And I'm glad I'm not it, because <laughs> now I get to do other service. OK. So by the way, this is just, I don't expect you to read this, but it's, I, it means a lot to me. This is the screenshot of the article we wrote together after the first nine months of us in this position and how we were making progress toward our vision. Okay. So here's another thing I get to do as a professor. I get to teach. Um, and one thing I did a couple years ago was I got this Teach Access mini grant. It was like $5,000 and it bought my time to make one of my classes a little bit more accessible. So, one thing I do with all my students is I make sure that they learn how to make accessible digital documents. And then I make them submit all their assignments in accessible digital format to the tune of 10% of their overall grade, because it matters. Um, the other thing I do is I host an annual careers in computing accessibility panel, which brings in computing professionals, um, several of whom have disabilities, and they talk about their work. Um, and the thing that really is, is cool about that 
is most all of my students up until that point have never seen a person with a disability who is a professional in computing. Even the disabled students in my class. It's really important that you have disability representation on your panels. So here's a screenshot of the assignment and actually of that panel. I have to give a shout out to some people in the audience. Um, Ian Granger who made, and, and William who made this event possible. And, um, oh, is this on? And um, Meredith Ehrenberg who served as a panelist. Thank you. All right, finally, as a professor, I get to do research. So one of the things that we're doing uh, lately in my lab is trying to get a sense of how inaccessible the publications in, my, in our research field are. Because if you're blind and you can't read research papers, you can't get a PhD. If you can't get a PhD, you can't be a professor or a researcher. It means you don't get to be in the room when knowledge is being made. It's really important that we break down those barriers. So uh, let me tell you, it's kind of grim. For some conferences in some years, basically 100% of their papers are not accessible. Others, it's more like 20%, but anyway, it's not okay. <laughs> so yeah, we're, it's, it's good to start from somewhere. Anyway, this is a screenshot of a kind of more fun paper that we're in the process of writing, where we're not only trying to get the re uh, research community to, re to reflect on their accessibility practices, um, but also kind of like teach them a little bit about accessibility and, and invite them to get more involved. All right, this is something that I also get to do as a professor. I get to say, hey class, take out your phones. I'm serious, take out your phones right now. We are gonna learn how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone. So what you can do is go to your settings. And when you go to settings, I'm gonna do it here. Look for accessibility. I don't care if you have an iPhone or Android, it's the same. And there should be an accessibility option. Uh, there we are. And when you go there, if you're on an iPhone, click on VoiceOver and turn it on. If you're on an Android, go to TalkBack and turn it on. <laughs> Accessibility. I wonder. Screen curtain oh, there we go. on. So, VoiceOver. What I'm doing is making some gestures on the screen. VoiceOver on. And then the screen Don't reader is reading what's on the screen out loud. And if you want to interact with the elements on the screen, you can double tap um, and things like that. So uh, in, a, in a nutshell, how a blind person interacts with a touchscreen phone is they use gestures and um, they use audio cues in order to interact with the content, right? So the reason I think it's so important that we know this, I'll just give you a few, although there are a lot. If we don't know how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone, we might assume that they can't use technology. I actually have a student who's been interviewing software engineers who are cited about uh, blind software engineers. And the number of people who say, blind people can't be software engineers is really distressing. It's just not true. <laughs> um, and uh, you can imagine if, 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 if people in your profession don't believe that you can even do the work, then how are they ever gonna hire you and respect you on the job? The other thing um, that this, knowing the answer to this question um, uh, teaches you is how to make digital media that they can access. Oh, turn it off. If you want to turn it off, you can hold the side button and talk to Siri or Google Assistant and say, turn off voiceover or turn off talk back. That'll help. <laughs> I'll come help you afterwards. <laughs> I do encourage you to play around with it, though, um, in your free time. So another thing um, that, that uh, we can't do if we don't know how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone is we can't host inclusive and accessible meetings and events. Did you know, for example, that every time you type something into the chat in a Zoom meeting that a blind person screen reader reads it out loud immediately to them? How hard is it to listen to the main meeting discussion when that's happening in the background? Right? Okay. So part four, what do we do? So recently, um, I conducted with uh, several colleagues and, and partners a listening campaign to try to understand the campus climate at UCI for students with disability, disabilities. And um, students, faculty, and staff, actually. And one of the things that we did is uh, we did a survey of 250 of them. The number one thing we found was that people with disabilities on campus 
feel misunderstood and isolated, and that there is no community in which they can be themselves. So um, I think what we need is administration to help create a space on campus for people with disabilities to be in community. <laughs> Thank you, good job. Um, and um, administration's actually been stepping up. There's some really exciting stuff in the works. So for example, that listening campaign that I'm talking about, it was actually um, part of the work of the Disability Cultural Center Task Force, which I participated in. Um, what we did as a task force is we scoped out the need um, and the sh potential shape for a disability cultural center, which is essentially like an LGBTQ resource center or a women's su uh, success center but for people with disabilities, the largest minority population in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks to Vice Chancellor Willie Banks Jr. and Assistant Vice Chancellor Edgar Dormitorio, um, there's hope that maybe UCI could be the first in the UC to have such a place for students. Okay, so not only that, but um, accessibility and disability are mentioned for the first time in our strategic plan for UCI, thanks to Vice Provost Roxy Silver and Chancellor Gilman, who made that possible. So I think that there is an exciting opportunity here for administration to start making structural change that creates space for students with disabilities on campus. Um, the other thing is, this is the cover of the report. I love it because uh, the artwork was drawn by a student with a disability. Um, the other thing that we can do is, how many of you are on committees or task force or working groups. Yeah, a lot of us. Um, in those places, there's stuff we can do on like a kind of like a monthly scale um, that can make a difference. So for example, what I have up here um, is um, a reference to what the IT Accessibility Work Group started a couple of years ago under Meredith Ehrenberg's leadership and with, I know, the support of Sampon Ino. They created this Accessibility Trees badging program. It's a set of like self-guided tasks that are going to teach you about accessibility and you can earn one of these cute little badges. So uh, here's a screenshot of the badging program. Let's all go earn our badge at accessibility.uci.edu. Um, and then finally, there's a lot of little things that we can do day to day um, that can make a big change. And the example I have up here is actually um, from when we were preparing for this talk. Debbie Nielsen, who was supporting um, a supporting staff member, she sent me a Zotmail draft that was going to be sent out to the community. And I noticed a bunch of click here's links, right? Click here links are really problematic for accessibility because blind people can't tell the difference between this click here and that click here. <laughs> you need to have meaningful labels, right? And so I wrote her a, an email back to say like, oh, can we change the click here's to meaningful labels? Here's some um, rationale for that. And you know what Debbie did? She was amazing. Um, not only did she change the links in my Zotmail, she changed it in the template. <laughs> so now this problem is fixed going forward. So here's the screenshot. I know you can't read it, but it's the moment when Debbie became an accessibility ally slash hero for me. <laughs> Thank you so much, Debbie. Little things like that really make a difference. All right. So do you see how my question is more than what it seems? This question is a symbol for me about, uh, first of all, um, the ways that my field, computer science and higher education, are failing people with disabilities. It's also a symbol for how there are social divides and digital divides between people with and people without disabilities. We are living in different realities almost. Um, but it's also a symbol of hope, right? A question like this enables us to have this conversation. And I think it inspires curiosity in us to try to understand the disabled experience, to try to explore our own relationship with disability, um, and you know, to try to make a little bit of progress every day to make things better. So I have one more question for you. Do you know how a blind person uses a touchscreen phone? I'm seeing head nods, yes, okay, okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. Questions? <laughs> oh no, did I put everyone to sleep? <laughs>
Are you still trying to figure out how to turn off your, your screen reader? <laughs> Oh, oh, let's wait for the microphone. Sorry. Thank you so much. Stacey, this is Gwen Black. I work with Hi, Andrew. Gwen. Hi. Um, just wanted to ask what your experience was and how, if you can talk a little bit about that um, course that you developed, right, huh. for faculty last year with the grant that you offered this oh. earlier this year. Is it that the ICDI, the Inclusive yes. Course Design Institute, with DTEI, oh my gosh, acronym suit, Division of Teaching Excellence and Innovation? So actually that, I got really lucky and my name got added on to an effort that um, some of my dear colleagues were actually leading. I think it was Meredith Ehrenberg and Megan Linos and maybe a couple other folks. But this is, uh, they got a little chunk of money to um, create an inclusive uh, teaching workshop series that included very prominently accessibility which is wonderful. And so um, I got to participate in a couple of the events and participate in the panel. Um, and I've actually included in my link tree um, a, a link to some of the resources that we provided to faculty. Um, but I think the key thing there is there's this notion of universal design for learning. Have you all ever heard of uni universal design before? <laughs> it's this idea that we should design technologies or curricula so that the most people, the widest variety of people can access it, right? So maybe you are somebody, are you somebody who's ever used that door actuator with the, um, to automatically open a door? Yep, right. That's universally designed because lots of different people b benefit from it. Um, in curricula, there are similar things like having captions automatically displayed. It's a best practice. Because you benefit from that if you're deaf or hard of hearing, but also if you're in a really quiet environment, like a library, in a loud place, like a bar, um, or you know, if you, um, I forget the other ones, if you're an English language learner, lots of other examples, right? So yeah, so that's one of the, the concepts that we covered there is universal design for learning and how you can make these little tweaks to your classes to make them accessible from the get-go for more people. Good question, thank you. Great talk. Thank you. Um, how do we sign up for the accessibility class? Ooh, so this class that I'm talking about is called Informatics 131. It's an undergraduate course mostly taken by junior and senior level computer science and informatics majors. Um, and I actually don't know if folks can take it from across campus. <laughs> but about 300 people take it every quarter. And when I teach it, I just try to have, we have a, an accessibility minute. <laughs> so for every lecture, there's just about three to five minutes trying to show how the content of the class, which is all about how we design technology for people, relates to accessibility. Um, I think it's really important that you don't silo off things like ethics, accessibility, gender inclusion, things like that. It's important that you show that it's germane to the topic across all levels. So we don't just have one lecture about it. Um, but uh, at the grad level, my colleague just created this class. I don't remember the name of it, but Anne Marie Piper created a class for graduate students that's all about accessibility. Um, so you should contact me and I'm happy to show you uh, there's some pockets of accessibility in the various courses that my colleagues teach and I'd be happy to share that with you. By the way, I welcome infer, like, uh, inquiries. Just put what matters to me and why, WMMW in the, in the email um, title and I'd be happy to try to hook you up with resources or connect you to people. Good question. Any other questions? Yes, please, Stacy. Thank you. <laughs> uh, my question is, as someone who's obviously um, minoritized in multiple ways in mm -hmm. your research and uh, work community, mm -hmm. what are ways that you r recharge? Like, how do you oh. keep yourself well, and and how do you make sure that you're enjoying life and you're a whole person in addition <laughs> to all this advocacy? <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, I'm glad you asked that because I actually took the rest of today off because I've had a lot of late nights for various projects this week. Um, and, uh, and I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go to my favorite place. <laughs> um, but honestly, I think that uh, it's important to have different communities um, and to be able to access those different communities in times of need. 
So sometimes I'm very energized to be in a community where people don't understand who I am. And I like, you know, I can actively kind of teach them about it. Other times I just want to be with people who get me and I don't have to do any of that translation work. <laughs> so I got, you know, I have a bi-weekly meeting with some of my best buds and we do that. Um, I'm actually trying to create right now an affinity group with some, with some collaborators for, um, called the Association for Disabled Faculty and Staff. Um, so I think that it's all about kind of uh, creating, cultivating different communities in which um, you can recharge sometimes and you can uh, share your energy in other places and then taking time off. I hope that helps. For those of us who maybe don't identify as having a disability but mm -hmm. want to be good advocates and good allies, <laughs> where do you suggest we start? Oh my goodness. Okay, I love this. Well, you know that there's actually, um, in addition to the badging program, there is a pledge. I know that you know this because you led the charge, but there is an accessibility pledge at accessibility.uci.edu slash pledge. And um, on there, it has a list of resources as you pledge <laughs> that you can start to explore to think about your own relationship to ableism um, and how you can start to learn about the dis disability perspective um, and ways to engage. The thing is, disability is such a broad category. There's so, I'm, there's so many ways in which I'm still ableist with particular disability communities because I know a lot about blindness and low vision, but I don't know a lot about, um, for example, the deaf and hard of hearing community or the neurodivergent community. So um, I think it's just a matter of diving in, learning bit by bit, finding some buddies who want to learn with you, <laughs> you know, do a little book club or do a little practice or, or what have you together. Um, and, and just being dedicated to the long journey of trying to understand others' experiences, listening, and being there to support. We have two more minutes. Oh, a question over here. Oh, hi. Uh Oh, hi, I want to say thank you for your work. Uh, uh, I'm a visually impaired student and uh, it's very uh, validating for me to look at your research. And oh. uh, uh, yeah, and for also just a comment for aspiring software engineers here. Uh, it's really important to do like w when you design websites or apps to have like those accessibility features, especially provide flexibility uh, for people who might be visually impaired to like for a, mm. for them to be able to access large fonts and uh, 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 and high contrast yes. uh, uh, interface and it will make the life so much easier and also uh, just uh, I guess some sometimes awareness is very important understanding is important because uh, like uh, as I started to work with a cane on campus not everyone is aware like yeah. what the cane means and yeah. uh, I run into people all the time, like they're not aware that I'm there. And uh, yeah. and uh, so so it's just uh, important to be aware because um, I my, my disease is progressive, so I didn't used yeah. to be so uh, impaired. Yeah. And I thought like all blind people are completely blind, but yes. that's not the case. It's only, there's only like over 90% on, yeah. uh, over ninety percent of blind people have yeah. some sort of vision. And uh, this vision also l looks different for different people yes. on the blindness spectrum. So, so I think it's just a really uh, like uh, even Google search to look up those information mm -hmm. can be a good place to start. Uh, there is a book uh, published in back in 2020 called Disability Visibility. It's a yes. very good book. <laughs> uh, not, uh, definitely not. Definitely not, uh, it's not including all kinds of uh, mm -hmm. di diverse experience, but it can be a good place to start if you're interested in some experience. Yeah, uh, yeah. that's wonderful. I think the book was uh, uh, brought together, edited by Alice Wong. Um, and I, I'm so happy that you pointed out, I, in my talk, I kind of glossed over the word blind, but it is true, 90% of people who are blind have usable vision. 
Okay, and actually one of my PhD students right now is legally blind but has a lot of usable vision. And so instead of using a screen reader, he uses magnification software. And it's really important that we're thinking about visual disability and all disabilities, frankly, as being on a spectrum and changing over time. So I'm so happy you brought that up. Thank you for adding that really important nuance. And um, I hope we have a chance to talk later. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. I think we may be out of time. Yep, I think we are out of time. So let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.